Right, so we're going to be looking at something called logical biconditionality. Now, what that is, is quite a fanciful way of saying, I'm going to give you two statements, and you have to decide whether or not the logic holds in either direction. And I'll show you what that means in a second. But for now, all we're going to do is I'm going to show up two statements. Here are two statements together. And you need to read them as, as, as such. If you are an adult, then you are over 18. And you just need to think, is that a true statement or not? And once you've done thinking that, you move on to the next one. And again, you read, if you are a parent, then you have a daughter and just decide whether or not that statement is true and keep going. So always read the if, ifs, then here's the next one. Uh, so decide whether that statement is true or not. Uh, then the next one. And finally, the, the fifth one on the screen just here. Okay, so make sure you do have some time to think about that. Make sure you read the if, this, then this statement every time. I hope you've decided which are which. I'll share with you what I think in just a second. So I think that if you're an adult, then you're definitely over 18. Based on sort of the definition that we go with, or at least the legal definition that we go with as being an adult, um, if you're an adult, then that means you are over 18. If you're a parent, I don't think you necessarily then have a daughter. You could be a parent to three sons, uh, to one son. Um, so I think that statement is, is not actually correct uh, necessarily. Uh, if you are Chris Hemsworth, uh, then you are beautiful. Uh, I mean, some people, th this is the first one we've seen that's sort of objective or subjective. People could disagree here. I think they'd be in the minority, and I would personally just call them straight up wrong. But it's a little bit different, this third one, to the first two, because here, again, we were thinking about definitions of things. Um, and we're, these were pretty much inarguable, whereas this is, I guess, arguable, but most people would agree with probably what I've done here. If you're a twin, then you are a sister. I don't think this is true at all. Um, it could be true. You could be a girl who's a twin and therefore be both, but it's not necessarily true, right? You, you could be a boy who's a twin and then you're not a sister. Um, so I don't think that's true. Uh, if X is greater than four, then I think it's necessarily true that X is greater than two. Um, and so this is what I came up with. Tick, cross, tick, cross, tick. Now, Okay, so that's probably fairly straightforward uh, for the most part. What I'm going to do here, though, is I'm actually going to um, take both these statements and I'm going to swap the order in which we look at them. Um, so now we're going to read every statement again, but we're going to do if this, then this, and now then the opposite order. And I, again, I want you to evaluate. Try and remember tick, cross, tick, cross, tick, because that's what it used to be. But now evaluate each statement again, this way, the other way around. And again, think about whether or not these statements are true or not. Okay, so hopefully you've had time maybe to pause the video and think about that. Um, I still think this first statement is true. If you're over 18, then you are an adult. Again, sort of by definition. So, so this statement has not, nothing has happened to this. It was true before, and it's still true. If you have a daughter, you are a parent. Um, yeah, I think that's true. And remember, it used to not be. We used to have, if you're a parent, then you have a daughter. And we agreed that probably wasn't true. But I think this direction, it, it suddenly becomes true. Um, if we read it the other way around. Uh, if you are beautiful, then you're Chris Hemsworth. Now, remember before, this was kind of a, a subjective question, um, though most people probably agreed with what I put. But now I think it's inarguably not true. Uh, if you are beautiful, then you are not necessarily Chris Hemsworth. You could be. And like in all of these, you could be. But what we're really asking is, are you definitely that? Like, if this, are you definitely this? And there, are, I'm sure there are lots of beautiful people watching this video who are not Chris Hemsworth. Um, it's an unusually wholesome moment for my channel there to just, let's just take recognition of that. Also, though, if you are Chris Hemsworth and you're watching, um, please DM me. But anyway, I don't think that's true. So, yeah. If you are a sister, um, then you are a twin. Now, remember this statement wasn't true before, and I still don't think it's true. Um, if uh, There are plenty of sisters in the world who are not twins, and plenty of people who are sisters who are definitely not twins. If X is greater than two, then X is greater than four. This is also not true. Uh, X could be three here, uh, and then this would not be true. So we've just found an example in which it's not true. So we used to be tick, cross, tick, cross, tick. So this statement and this statement have remained the same. One was true before and is still true. This one was false before and is still false. But all of the other three have changed what they were doing. Um, one used to be false, this used to be true, this used to be true as well, but now have all swapped. 
So this is the title of the video, Logical Biconditionality. There are two conditions here. There's this one and this one. And what we're asking is, in what order can you read these for them to be true, for them to be false? Do they change when you change the order? Because sometimes they don't change, and sometimes they do. And mathematicians are intensely interested in these questions, particularly as they pertain to mathematical statements. So unfortunately, on the whole, the mathematical community isn't amazingly interested in Chris Hemsworth and his beauty, but we are interested in mathematical statements. Now, before we get to the mathematical statements, um, I just want to formalize the notation that mathematicians would use for all of these things. Um, if you have a statement, so notice here we've gone back to the original thing we were looking at. I've swapped the orders again back to what we were looking at originally. Um, so this one was true when we read it originally. Um, if you're an adult, you are over 18, but it was also true the other way around. So we use this uh, sign here to denote that this statement is true, whether you read left to right or whether you read right to left. And these arrows are kind of telling us, yeah, you're okay to read this in either direction. And it's, it's, it's absolutely fine. Do whatever you want. Now, this statement, if you remember, was not true the first time we read it, which is how it's on the screen now, but it was true the other. And so what we do is we put this sign in here to say, you're not allowed to read this from right to right, from, from left to right, as the arrow indicates, but you are allowed to read it from right to left, and it will work. Uh, this statement uh, was the opposite. It worked from left to right, but not from right to left. So we put in this arrow. I put in a little question mark just to note the fact that there is some subjectivity to this. And mathematicians don't like that. So technically, this sign shouldn't really be used because people would disagree. And with a mathematical statement, there would be no disagreement. So there's maybe just a, a small footnote to make here about that. But regardless, um, moving on, if you're a twin, you're a sister. Now, this wasn't true in either direction. It, it doesn't work right to left, and it doesn't work left to right. So we just denote it with maybe a cross through it to say, actually, you can't read this at all in either direction. It's, it's just not necessarily true at all. And this one finally was true left to right, but not right to left. So we'll use this symbol again. So these are the four symbols that we can use to denote behavior between two conditional statements. Um, and now, again, what I was saying is that mathematicians are interested in doing this for statements about maths. So here are a bunch of statements about maths. What I'd like you to do is, is pause this video and try and fit those four new symbols that I've taught you into each of these pairs. Um, and, and I'll go through the answers in just a bit, but just to remind you of how to do this, firstly, you read left to right. So you read if x is prime, then x has two factors. You decide whether or not that's true. And then you say, if x has two factors, then x is prime. And you decide whether that's true. So you have to read them one way, decide, and then read them the other and also decide. Because again, you can't take for granted, even if it did work left to right, the key thing here is you can't take that for granted whether or not it will work right to left because some things do and some things don't. Um, so yeah, give that some thought and give it some time and I'll, I'll go through the answers in just a second. So yeah, if x is prime, then x definitely has two factors. That's, uh, that's a definitional thing. We define primes to have two factors. And therefore, if x has two factors, it's prime. So this statement works in both directions. So I'll shove in this sign here to say that I could read that either way and it's fine. If x is the product of two primes, now this is quite a difficult one I've put on here. So what that means is x is, for example, could be something like 15. It's 3 times 5, the product of two primes. Now, if you are the product of two primes, you definitely have four factors because your factors will be 1, the two primes, and then yourself, the two primes multiplied together. So, for example, 15 has four factors, 1, 3, 5, and 15, and it can't have any other factors. It's just going to have those four. So this is definitely true left to right. The difficult question is, is it true right to left? And when you're trying to decide on this, the best thing to do is, is try to think of counterexamples. Can you think of a number that has four factors and yet doesn't have, that isn't just um, two primes multiplied together? And before too long, you'll find the number eight, which has four factors. It has the factors one, two, four, and eight. But eight isn't two primes multiplied together. So this is true left to right, but not right to left. Shape A has four sides. Does this mean shape A is a rectangle? No, clearly. Just draw a random four-sided irregular shape. But if shape A is a rectangle, then, four H, then shape A definitely has four sides. So it's true from right to left, um, because rectangles must have four sides. If x is prime, then x is a positive integer. Yeah, sure, of course, all primes are positive integers. If x is a positive integer, is x prime? No, of course not. 
it could be 8 or 10 or whatever. So this is true left to right, but not the other way. x squared bigger than 0. Okay, so, well, that's sh sure. Let's just park that for a minute. That if x squared is greater than 0, is x greater than 0? Well, okay, if x is 2, then 2 squared is 4, which is greater than 0, and 2 is greater than 0, so that's cool. If x is 10, 10 squared is 100, which is greater than 0, and 10 is greater than 0, so that's also true. But whenever you see squares, you immediately need to just jump on the negative train because you know negatives do something funky when you square them. So if x is negative 3, negative 3 squared is 9, which makes this true, but this isn't. Negative 3 isn't bigger than 0. So this isn't true left to right because I can think of negative 3, which passes this condition, but it doesn't do that one. So it's not true left to right. Is it true right to left? Well, actually, it is, right? Because... Any positive number squared is positive. In fact, this is kind of a trick almost because any number squared is positive except for zero. And so this statement is basically universally true, which means that it had a very good chance of working right to left. Um, all I needed to say was that x can't be zero, uh, which this um, doesn't let happen, so it's fine. So this works right to left. And what about this one? x plus y is greater than z. If that's true, is this true? Well, again, counterexamples are always the best thing to think of. Um, something that will make this work is if x is 0, y is 1, z is 0. That makes 1 greater than 0, which is true. But 0 isn't greater than 0. So this is not true left to right because I found a counterexample. What about uh, right to left then? Well, again, just think of an example here. If x is 2 and z is 1, this works. But putting them in here, 2, 1, and just choose y to be minus a million, and this won't work at all. So this is actually not true in either direction. Counterexamples are so important here. Try and think of counterexamples if you can. Um, is x a multiple of 3? Um, if x is, sorry, if x is a multiple of 3, is x a multiple of 9? Uh, again, counterexample, clearly no. x could be 6, right? 6 is a multiple of 3, but it's not a multiple of 9. So not true left to right. But if x is a multiple of 9, then it must be a multiple of 3. Because if you think of the multiples of 9, 9, 18, 27, um, I was struggling for the next one, but I think it's 36 uh, and then 45. Um, all of those are just in the three times table. They're just every third in the three times table. Um, so yeah, if x is a multiple of 9, it must be a multiple of 3. So this is the sign we have. I hope you got a bunch of those right. Just before I sign off here, I just wanted to talk maybe a little bit about what the kind of question that proper mathematicians would ask having understood this kind of logic a bit better. Um, so here's a simultaneous equation. Um, and if you solve, you can pause the video and solve this if you want to, but if you solve the simultaneous equation, you get the answer that x is minus 1 and y is 2. Or at least you should if you've done it correctly. Now, if you solve this simultaneous equation, and again, you can pause the video and, and you can do this if you want to, um, you'll also get the solution that x is minus 1 and y is 2, which seems like a bit of a coincidence. But then we notice... What do these simultaneous equations have in common? Well, if you just read the underlined coefficients, this one goes up in a nice arithmetic series. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. I add, it. I add 2 every time. But so does this one. I add 3 every time, and I get to the next one in the line. And it turns out, if you have a simultaneous equation whereby the coefficients, which are the numbers in front of the things, progress in an arithmetic sequence, then the solution is always minus 1, 2, every time. And the proof of this I'll leave as an exercise to the watcher. However, the question that mathematicians would then also be interested in, like it's tempting for um, inexperienced mathematicians to think, oh, that's such a cool proof, if you've proved it, which is amazing if you have. Um, oh, that's such a cool proof, I'm done, amazing, incredible. But what proper mathematicians would then immediately ask after they've done this is, well, actually, is this true the other way around? Like, if the solution to any simultaneous equation is minus 1, 2, did that mean that the coefficients were in an arithmetic sequence? Right? Is the statement true the other way? And you have a whole second proof to do in the other direction. And this is really important to mathematicians that we do this every single time. Because as we've seen in this video, you can't take for granted one way or the other, right? If you're going to do this, you have to do it properly and you have to go in both directions. So very often when you're proving something in maths, um, you have to prove it in both directions, once and then the other. So it increases the amount of work, but you know, that's just maths for you.